the discussion. So, Philip, the stage is yours. Uh, Craig, uh, thank you very much, and I'm uh, uh, delighted to be back, and uh, I hope you're not getting bored with me quite yet. Um, the title, as Craig said, for our session is uh, uh, Global Europe Game Over? Question mark. Now, there have been plenty of occasions, I think, since, uh, uh, since we last met here when one would have said this is very much a rhetorical question. Uh, some of us may have even written it once or twice. If Europe can't hold itself together, how on earth can it expect uh, to have a role on the global stage. And the crisis, uh, as far as the euro is concerned, our economy is concerned, isn't over. Um, it's out of the acute phase, but the one thing that we can be sure of is that uh, we're going to have austerity for some time. Europe's going to go to the NATO summit in the summer in the US promising more cuts in military expenditure. And if you look at the domestic politics of, of Europe, there are lots of pressures on both the left and right um, to close Europe's doors to uh, globalization. Just have a look at what's being said in the French election. But journalists are by trade gloomsters. And actually, if you look at, if you look at the reality Europe is doing quite a lot in the world. We have lots of our young men and women in harm's way in Afghanistan. Um, we're making progress, not fast enough, in the Balkans. We've introduced comprehensive sanctions against Iran. We're doing something in Syria. We do something and we contribute to keeping the climate change talks somewhere on the road. And places like Myanmar, with the United States, Europe's going to have something of an impact. But I think the question, and we've got such a distinguished panel, I'm going to shut up after this. The question for this session is, how ambitious can, should Europe be? Should we forget about the big, great power relationships where we have strategic partnerships with China and Russia that don't actually mean very much, and focus on our neighborhood, on the things that we can, on our soft power, on the things we can do well, concentrate on doing good where we can? Or actually, should we be thinking much more globally? Should we be thinking how we can partner the United States, for example, in the pivot to Asia? What, how can we work with them? And this distinguished panel is going to answer all those questions and all the questions I hope that you have. The format's going to be they're going to each speak for three or four minutes at most at the beginning. I might ask one or two questions myself, but basically speaking, I want to get it out to you. This is about, this is supposed to be a discussion, a conversation, a debate in which you're the uh, principal participants. So I'm going to start with uh, Radek Sikorsky, who um, everyone knows who he is. He's distinguished enough not to need uh, introduction. All our panelists are, actually. But um, uh, who gave a very interesting speech, as many of you know, in Berlin uh, earlier this year about the shape of Europe, and in particular about Germany's role in Europe, but speaks eloquently um, about Europe's role in the world and, and pushed during the Polish presidency the idea of a more coherent military uh, uh, identity uh, for the EU. Um, how ambitious should we be? Thanks. Um, I may not need an introduction, but they give me so much pleasure. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> As Henry Kissinger was, once said. Um, well, look, if you um, uh, break down uh, the United States and its components of power, what makes the United States a superpower? It's, of course, military, uh, economic, financial, monetary, the fact that the dollar is still a reserve currency, um, and uh, regulatory. And if you look at all those ingredients, you'll see that actually Europe 
has many of the same components. And my point would be that, the, that we have not marshaled them successfully. Uh, perhaps best regulatory. We are an even um, bigger economy than the United States. People want to trade here. Uh, and we can regulate uh, Microsoft. We can even, we're even beginning to regulate Gazprom. So this is beginning to work. Um, financial power, uh, we are the largest donor of international assistance uh, in the world. The way it's not marshaled is that we don't use those resources strategically. Um, some are tied to uh, member states, uh, colonial um, uh, legacy projects, uh, and we, are, we seem to be unable to make quick decisions when a crisis uh, uh, arises. On the reserve currency, it's, it's wobbly, but uh, perhaps in the long run. Um, uh, on, on military power, it's, uh, if, if we were a, a functioning political union, not only do we have around two million soldiers uh, under arms, we actually have nuclear weapons as well. Uh, and our combined defense budget uh, is, um, if, um, um, if I'm right, bigger than China, India, and Russia combined. But again, it is not used the way a superpower would use it. Where we have an advantage over the United States is that we are territorially an unfinished project. So people, countries are still knocking at our door. And enlargement, the promise of enlargement, is one of our most effective tools. And, um, and that's why I believe that we should exercise our power, such as it is, primarily in our neighborhood. Today we pass sanctions on Iran, Syria, and Belarus. If we can't fix our neighborhood, then clearly we'll not be able to act globally. This is where our gravitational pull is stronger, and that's where, where I think um, um, we can show it. Uh, of course, our diplomacy is only being created, so my conclusion is, no, it's not over, because we've barely begun. Thank you very much. Um, two big points there, fixing our neighborhood but also marshalling uh, the, the elements of European power. And uh, I think that's how we do that is going to be a big part of the, uh, uh, the conversation. Um, Alexander Lambsdorff uh, uh, is president of, I think it's president or chairman of the European Liberal Forum and heads the, uh, uh, the German liberals in the European Parliament. Now, I'm going to because I'm a journalist, I can ask slightly sort of off questions. I mean, I spend a lot of time going to Germany. It's a great place. And I, get, I come away with the impression that, that policymakers want to turn it into greater Switzerland. It's be global, global on trade, investment. But hey, why can't other people fix all the sort of difficult things uh, in the world? Um, am I being unfair? No, you're not being unfair, and I think Switzerland is a wonderful country. Um, so a big Switzerland is even more wonderful. Um, neutral, however, I big neutral Switzerland? No, but not neutral. I mean, the neutrality thing is something different. I, I would say that uh, this, this image of a bigger Switzerland is something that is, of course, popular in Germany. People don't think about it, they don't express it that way, but the notion of living in a world where we are left in peace to build cars and produce things that we can export around the world and, and nobody's going to come and harm us is, is an idyllic vision that of course is popular because it, it speaks of peaceful times of, of trade and interaction uh, without uh, you know, real problems. The reality of course is entirely different. Uh, German soldiers are in Afghanistan, German uh, boats patrol the Horn of Africa, um, we have soldiers in the Balkans. So the situation uh, that we encounter in reality is very different from this idyllic idea that, that may have attraction in the, in the broader public. But um, where I take your point is that it's very difficult to marshal the ambition of, say, policy leaders and, and, and the foreign policy elites for a stronger European role into something that would actually resonate with the broader public. And when Radek Sikorsky here says we don't use our resources efficiently and effectively, 
I think that's that's one of the, the, the points. There is no debate the way it should be about a stronger European role in foreign policy in Germany that is looking seriously at the issues that this would uh, create inside Germany. One issue, however, has been resolved. Not in the light, really, of European uh, developments, but more in the light of domestic uh, requests, and that's the abolition of uh, the draft uh, and the transition to a professional army. 20 years after the end of the Cold War, we have finally, finally made that step, which I believe is reasonable, because if we want uh, our armed forces to be uh, able to, to, to cooperate with others, I think it's good to go down the path of professionalization. However, at the same time, we still have something in uh, Germany that is very strange to many other people. We have our parliament controlling the mandate down to the rules of engagement of every military mission that we have. If we were to be serious about a European security policy, including a military element, we would have to discuss this. But it's a very, very difficult issue, especially in my, inside my own political party, um, where the Parlaments Armee is something that is sacred. It is absolutely sacred, but if we want to move on to some joint European operations with quick crisis reaction capabilities, that is going to make things difficult. Now, what does this mean uh, inside Europe? I don't quite know, because we see two trends in Europe. And I, uh, looking at the question of this panel, global Europe game over, question mark, either it's over or it's just beginning. The, the reason I'm saying this is that um, on the one hand, inside the European Union, now you have the Weimar Initiative of Poland, Germany and France trying to build up more European capabilities for crisis management, a civilian headquarter here in Brussels, to be able really to you know, marshal our security resources as well as uh, the, the other ones that, that Radek Sikorsky spoke of. At the same time, however, we are two years away from an agreement entering into force between Britain and France that is entirely outside European structures, the Lancaster House Agreement on uh, nuclear cooperation, on uh, strategic power projection, on naval cooperation, where the vision that the two contracting parties have couldn't be more different. Alain Juppé in, in the European Parliament said, well, it's fully compatible with ESDP, European Security and Defense Policy. And then in the European Parliament, a member of the Tories spoke up and said, hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm from Perfidious Albion, and thank God we have l'entente cordiale again, and we want to work it outside the European Union. Now, which way are we going? Are we going inside the European Union, trying to uh, be serious about cooperation? Or are the two very nations that started it all in 1998 in Saint-Malo, moving outside of the European Union? I believe that's the big question for the future. Will the EU, as such, be a strategic actor, yes or no? Because I think the biggest deficit and uh, Radek spoke to that, is that with all the power resources we have, we lack this crucial element. We are not a security actor outside of our immediate neighborhood. And even in the immediate neighborhood, when push comes to shove, we, we, we rely on member states, like in the Libyan case, where France and Britain were the two leading powers. Thank you. Another two big thoughts there. Um, can uh, Germany... Uh close the gap, if you like, between this idealized view of the world and the reality that it does participate. But also, is it going to be possible for Europe to be a security actor with this slightly variable geometry of uh, uh, arrangements? Um, for those of you who don't know um, even Krestov, from who's chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies, uh, even or Mr. Krestov, I should call him, I suppose, in this uh, audience um, is one of those people who puts the thinking into think tanks. So even from your side of Europe, as it were, your end of Europe, from new Europe, as, a, as one famous American politician once described it, how does this look? Listen, I'm in a much easier position because when you're coming from the think tank, you can say what you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, but for me, the most interesting story is we are slightly in the wrong debate all the time. For example, the debate, are we pessimists or optimists about Europe? By the way, the Bulgarian definition is that the difference between the pessimist and the optimist is that the pessimist is the one who said that it cannot be worse. And the optimist <laughs> says it can. Uh, so, from, uh, from, from, the, from, from this point of view, uh, all this talk about global Europe, you have, in my view, two good news and three questions. The good news is, first, 
The easiest way to lose money on the market is if you fall in love with trends and if you're not interested in volumes. And Europe was not doing well on trends for the last two or three years, but also what the minister said on volumes, we're doing well. In a certain way, there is a lot of global capacity. And nevertheless, what are this basically happening in the last three months or six months? All the capacity that have been there three years ago are still here. The second thing which is also important in my view is that even in these two or three years, Europe does not lose a kind of a taste for global involvement. If you're going to ask three years ago, can Europe be as active on places like Syria, Iran, and others, most of the people are going to say no. So from this point of view, that's a good news. In my view, three kinds of a big issues has changed. The first is the very definition, when Europe learned that we are not as strong as we believed we were. You have two indebted places these days. You have the United States, and you have some of the European Union member states. But the United States is, is refunding their, refinancing their debt on a very nice interest rate. Europeans not. Why? Because to be strong these days, it means to make to throw your problems on others. <laughs> and I do believe this is very important. You should be part of the world. If others are not seeing your problem as their problems, there is a problem with your influence. And I do believe this is one of the problems and one of the things that Europe learned. The second thing is that others started to perceive Europe as weaker than it is. Now talking about how weak Europe is, in my view, is becoming fashionable. And this should basically threaten Europeans. The way you are perceived matters. And, and my last point is going to do on this. When we have been talking about global Europe five years ago, ten years ago, what it meant was that the world is going to resemble more and more European Union. Post-sovereignist, secular place, and so on and so on. If this is the idea, probably the global Europe is over. Probably the world in 10 years is not going to be simply a version of European Union. But the good news is that because this is the case, now we can start to be interested in the world. Because before we are going to a place just to see when they are going to become European Union. <laughs> you are going and basically telling the Turks, let's do it what worked in Bulgaria or Macedonia. Turkey is slightly bigger. Uh, uh, and this is true for China, and it's true for India. So I do believe that the good news about this crisis and about this new global Europe debate is we should be curious once again. Europe has lost certain curiosity for the last decade. And now I do believe we are paying for this. But these curiosities can come back. And honestly, I was very proud listening to reading the truth as Minister Sikorsky in Berlin. Because it means that we can change the debate. We can change the way we talk about Europe. And if we're going to do this, uh, probably next conference is going to be why global Europe is back. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. It's a really uh, a good thought. The, um, the world's not going to be like Europe after all, but I mean, some of us fear that Europe may turn out to be rather like the Westphalian world as well. But, yeah. um, but um, Senator Shaheed, you've got the, uh, the hardest uh, and most important task on this, uh, on this panel, because having listened to your European colleagues, you've got to really say from a transatlantic perspective and as someone steeped in transatlantic relations, I mean, are these people shaping up? I mean, we've had from the administration the pivot to Asia. Um, we've had, although President Obama gave my own prime minister a pretty good show in Washington the other day, but some of us thought maybe form rather than substance. But, uh, but I mean, are Europeans shaping up? And what does the United States expect them to do to shape up? So you don't like baseball? <laughs> which was one of the high points, points. or basketball. Um, you know, it's, an in, it's interesting to listen to all of you um, because I, I guess from our perspective, at least as I represent the Senate, um, we look at Europe as one of our best um, longest partners and um, we have the biggest economic relationship in the world now our our trade is dwarfs anything else in the world we have a security relationship that goes back um, decades 
as you were talking, um, Minister Sikorsky, about the, the five things that you see that Europe, um, that the U.S. has and compared them to Europe, one of the things that I thought you left off your list that Yvonne addressed somewhat is um, in addition to all of those um, assets, there's also an inclination to get engaged with the rest of the world and to be a participant. And I guess from our perspective, we see Europe as doing that. Um, as, we, as you talked in your opening about um, the efforts where Europe is engaged um, with the US, certainly Afghanistan, um, on Iran sanctions, the effort in Libya where um, NATO um, really perform there, but the U.S. was engaged, but it was NATO and the Europeans who carried off that um, effort in Libya in a way that was successful. So we had uh, an event in the Senate last week with Madeleine Albright, and this issue came up, and former Secretary Albright said, well, you know, when we think about a crisis somewhere in the world, the, f the first people we call are the Europeans. Um, and so I, I, I think we see the challenges that you're facing in terms of um, economic, and obviously that's been, had an impact on us as well. We are, we are breathing a sigh of relief that things are looking better here. Um, but uh, a strong Europe economically and from a security perspective, is very important to us in the United States, and um, we, we support that effort and see our relationship as being the most important relationship that we have. Can I try and pin you down on something? If there was one thing that Europe, that, you know, with, with, from your perspective, that Europe should be doing more of putting more effort into um, focusing more on, what would it be? Well, obviously, we'd, we would like to have seen action faster on the financial crisis here and appreciated Minister Sikorsky's uh, remarks in Germany um, because I think they reflected what many of us in the U.S. have felt. Um, certainly appreciate the participation in NATO. And I think many of us in the US see um, the security aspect of Europe as being NATO and question the extent to which you want to develop uh, a parallel structure around defense in Europe when we have this alliance that's been working for you know, decades now that has been so successful. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up, but I'm just going to have one more question myself to Minister Sikorsky, which is, you talked about um, marshalling the elements of our power. Okay, this is the same sort of question. The one thing that Europe could do now or next month or in a couple of months' time or this year that would move it significantly in that direction? I don't think it can be realistically done this year, but um, what we need is a sort of Nietzschean will to power. We need to um, create positions of leadership and then elect leaders um, to exercise it. And um, at the moment, we're constructed like a multilateral institution, um, which is why we advocate the joining of the two um, posts of the uh, chairman uh, of the European Commission and the uh, president of the European Council. And having that person elected um, more democratically than today. Herman Van Rompuy's um, term of office was extended two weeks ago. I bet you most people in this room didn't notice. Uh, whereas we need uh, a leader of Europe that would be elected either by the European Parliament or even more broadly than that to really 
um, uh, to be able to move things in Europe and to speak on behalf of Europe. Thank you. Okay, well, our speakers have um, put some really uh, interesting thoughts and arguments on the table. Um, now I'd like yours. Some of your names I know, others I don't, so I'm going to pretend I don't know anybody and just point, and that's the... Um, who'd like to uh, open up? S gentleman at the back there, who I can't see. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I want to come back... Could you introduce yourself? Uh, Bruce Sorry. Jackson, uh, Project on Transitional Democracies. I'm delighted to know the crisis of Europe is over, but I still don't understand the crisis itself. I want to come back to even Kress stuff and push him a little harder. You wrote that there was a crisis of political culture in Europe, and you described the European Union as a world of the, uh, that was already in the past. What did you mean by that? What is this crisis, and how does curiosity end up solving a political crisis of culture? Actually, I got to, I'll take this gentleman here, and then I'm going to move over to the other side. My name is Marcos Freitas, I'm from Brazil. I wanted to ask you a very quick uh, question. Do you see the economic crisis creating a divide in Europe between North and South? And, uh, and last year in the World Bank's meetings, there was a discussion regarding leadership and the problems that you're facing in the continent. How's it going? How's it being addressed uh, in the renewal of leadership in Europe? Okay, thank you. Uh, the lady in the second row there and then the lady in the third row. Javela from the uh, European Parliament. How do you exactly define uh, the role of global leadership of Europe? Do you define it by the means we exhibited in Libya and now there are 500 militia groups in the country that they are going around and the country is almost divided into three parts do you define it the way we behaved with Egypt, and Egypt is in a chaos now? Do you define global European leadership by fiscal discipline? And we see the South collapsing due to the monetary union we have. Where is the vision of Europe, actually? Is this what, you know, we said as examples, look how we acted in Libya. We acted in Libya, and now Libya is abandoned. It's a wild place. Nobody can reach it, and the people cannot even have access to food. You have to break embargoes through pirates okay. to get food to the people. So where is the vision, and where is the definition of the role? Thank you. 